First Nicene Council, Rise and Decline of Arianism, A.D. 325, by Johann Lorenz von Mosheim. Controversies in the Christian Church concerning the mystery of the Trinity began in the second century, prior to which the word Trinity, a term not found in the scriptures, had scarcely been used in Christian writings. It was prominently introduced by theologians of the second century, who employed new metaphysical methods in their attempts to explain the divine nature. The dispute turned upon the questions whether Christ was God or man, or an intermediate being, whether or not he was created, and like inquiries. Arius, a deacon of Alexandria, early in the fourth century, held that Christ was a created being, though superior to all other created beings. The Son, he maintained, is of a nature similar to, not the same as, that of the Father, to whom the Son is subordinate. This heresy obtained such currency in the Church that, in 321, a provincial synod at Alexandria excommunicated Arius, who in his learned writings had set them forth since 318. Once started among the people, the controversy begun in the schools became very bitter, and in many of the churches partisans of the heretical view equaled in number those of the Orthodox. Meanwhile, Arius continued to publish his doctrines. The Emperor Constantine, having become the patron of Christianity, conceived that the controversy might be settled by an assembly of the whole church, and in the year 325 he convoked the first council of Nicaea, which was also the first ecumenical or general council. At this council, before which Arius defended his views, over 300 bishops were in attendance, and pronounced in favor of the orthodox doctrine, that of the equality of the Son with the Father, and condemned the Arians to exile and their books to be burned. This council also promulgated the Nicene Creed in its early form. The chief opponent of the Arians was Athanasius, the father of orthodoxy, whose name was given to a modified creed later adopted into the Greek, Roman and English services. The Arian heresy, however, continued to spread in the East, and had the strong support of Constantine and his son Constantius. The controversy was renewed again and again, and for a long time Arianism was an important factor in theological and political affairs. Some phases of its peculiar doctrine have reappeared in various teachings and sects of modern times. But the orthodox doctrine affirmed at Nicaea has prevailed in the great branches of the Christian Church, and the acceptance of its fundamental principle, that of the Incarnation, in the post-apostolic age, was destined to have an incalculable influence upon the development of individual and national life, civil as well as religious, throughout the world. Johann Lorenz von Mosheim In the year 317, a storm arose in Egypt, which spread its ravages over the whole Christian world. The ground of this controversy was the doctrine of three persons in the Godhead, which during the three preceding centuries had not been in all respect defined. The doctors explained this subject in different ways, and gave various representations of the difference between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, without offense being taken. Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria, it is uncertain on what occasion, expressed himself very freely on this subject in a meeting of his presbyters, and maintained, among other things, that the Son possesses not only the same dignity as the Father, but also the same essence. But Arius, one of the presbyters, a man of an acute mind and fluent, at first denied the truth of Alexander's positions, on the ground that they were allied to the Sabellian errors which were condemned by the Church, and then, going to the opposite extreme, he maintained that the Son is totally and essentially distinct from the Father, that he was only the first and noblest of those created beings whom God the Father formed out of nothing, 
and the instrument which the Father used in creating the material universe, and therefore that he was inferior to the Father, both in nature and in dignity. No one of the ancients has left us a connected and systematic account of the religion professed by Arius and his associates. The opinions of Arius were no sooner divulged than they found very many abettors, and among them men of distinguished talents and rank, both in Egypt and the neighboring provinces. Alexander, on the other hand, accused Arius of blasphemy before two councils assembled at Alexandria and cast him out of the church. He was not discouraged by this disgrace, but retiring to Palestine he wrote various letters to men of distinction, in which he labored to demonstrate the truth of his doctrines, and with so much success that he drew over immense numbers to his side, and in particular Eusebius, bishop of Nicomedia, who was a man of vast influence. The emperor Constantine, who considered the discussion as relating to a matter of little importance, and remote from the fundamentals of religion, at first addressed the disputants by letter, admonishing them to desist from contention. But when he found that nothing was effected by this measure, and that greater commotion was daily rising throughout the empire, he in the year 325 summoned that famous council of the whole church, which met at Nike in Bithynia, to put an end to this controversy. In this council, after various altercations and conflicts of the bishops, the doctrine of Arius was condemned, Christ was pronounced to be of the same essence with the Father, Arius was sent into exile in Illyricum, and his followers were compelled to assent to a creed or confession of faith composed by the council. No part of church history, perhaps, has acquired more celebrity than this assembly of bishops at Niki to settle the affairs of the church, and yet it is very singular that scarcely any part of ecclesiastical history has been investigated and explained more negligently. The ancient writers are not agreed as to the time and year, nor the place, nor the number of the judges, nor the president of this council, nor as to many other particulars. No written journal of the proceedings of this venerable tribunal was kept, at least none has reached us. How many and what canons or ecclesiastical laws were enacted is not agreed on by the Eastern and Western Christians. The latter tell us they were only twenty in number, but the Orientals make them far more numerous. From the canons universally received and from the other monuments of the council, it appears not only that Arius was condemned, but that other things were decreed with a view to settle the affairs of the church. In particular, the controversy respecting this time of celebrating Easter, which had long perplexed Christians, was terminated. The jurisdiction of the greater bishops was defined, and several other matters of a like nature were determined. But the passions of men were more efficient than either the decrees of the Nicene Council or the authority of the emperor, for there were those who, Though they did not fall in with the doctrine of Arius, yet were dissatisfied with some things in the decrees and the creed of the council, and the Arians left no means untried to free themselves from the evils inflicted on them by those decrees. And the issue was favorable to their wishes, for in a few years after the Nicene Council, an Arian presbyter whom Constantia, the emperor's sister, at her death, had recommended to the care of her brother, succeeded in persuading Constantine the Great that Arius had been wrongfully condemned from personal enmity. Accordingly, in the year 330, the emperor recalled Arius from exile, rescinded the decrees passed against his associates and friends, and permitted Eusebius of Nicomedia, the principal supporter of Arius and his powerful faction, now thirsting for revenge, to persecute the defenders of the Nicene Council. They assailed no one more fiercely than Athanasius, the bishop of Alexandria. When he could in no way be brought to restore Arius to his former honors and ecclesiastical standing, Athanasius was first deprived of his office, in a council held at Tyre, 
A.D. 335, and then banished to Gaul, while in the same year, by a numerous council held at Jerusalem, Arius and his friends were solemnly admitted to the communion of the church. But by none of these proceedings could the Alexandrians be induced to receive Arius among their presbyters. Accordingly, the emperor called him to Constantinople in the year 336, and ordered Alexander, the bishop of that city, to open the doors of his church to him. But before that could take place, Arius died at Constantinople in a tragical manner, and the emperor himself closed life shortly after. After the death of Constantine the Great, one of his sons, Constantius, the emperor of the East, with his wife and his court, was very partial to the Arian cause, but Constantine and Constance supported in the western parts, where they governed, the decisions of the Nicene Council. Hence, the broils, the commotions, the plots, the injuries had neither measure nor bounds, and on both sides councils were assembled to oppose councils. Constance died in the year 350, and two years afterward, a great part of the West, particularly Italy and Rome, came under the dominion of his brother Constantius. This revolution was most disastrous to the friends of the Nicene Council, for this emperor, being devoted to the Arians, involved the others in numerous evils and calamities, and by threats and punishments compelled many of them to apostatize to that sect to which he was himself attached. The Nicene party made no hesitation to return the same treatment as soon as time, place and opportunity were afforded them, and the history of Christianity under Constantius presents a picture of a most stormy period and of a war among brethren which was carried on without religion or justice or humanity. On the death of Constantius in the year 362, the prosperous days of the Arians were at an end. Julian had no partiality for either, and therefore patronized neither the Arians nor the Orthodox. Jovian espoused the Orthodox sentiments, and therefore all the West, with no small part of the East, rejecting Arian views, reverted to the doctrines of the Nicene Council. But the scene was changed under the two brothers Valentinian and Valens, who were advanced to the government of the empire in the year 364. Valentinian adhered to the decisions at Nike, and therefore in the West the Arian sect, a few churches excepted, was wholly extirpated. Valens, on the contrary, took sides with the Arians, and hence in the eastern provinces many calamities befell the Orthodox. But when this emperor had fallen in a war with the Goth, A.D. 378, Gratian, who succeeded Valentinian in the West, in the year 376, and became master of the whole empire in 378, restored peace to the Orthodox. After him, Theodosius the Great, by depriving the Arians of all their churches and enacting severe laws against them, caused the decisions of the Nicene Council to triumph everywhere, and none could any longer publicly profess Arian doctrines, except among the barbarous nations, the Goths, the Vandals, and the Burgundians. That there were great faults on both sides in this long and violent contest, no candid person can deny. But which party was guilty of the greatest wrong, it is difficult to say. The Arians would have done much more harm to the Church if they had not become divided among themselves after the Nicene Council, and split into sects which could not endure each other. Unhappily, the Arian contests produced, as was very natural, some new sects. Some persons, while eager to avoid and to confute the opinions of Arius, fell into opinions equally dangerous. Others, after treading in the footsteps of Arius, ventured on, far beyond him, and became still greater errorists. The human mind, weak and subject to the control of the senses and the imagination, seldom exerts all its energies to comprehend divine subjects in such a manner as to be duly guarded against extremes. In the former class I would reckon Apollinaris the Younger, Bishop of Laodicea, 
though otherwise a man of great merit, and one who in various ways rendered important service to the church. He manfully asserted the divinity of Christ against the Arians, but by philosophizing too freely and too eagerly, he almost set aside the human nature of the Savior. This great man was led astray, not merely by the ardor of debate, but likewise by his immoderate attachment to the Platonic doctrine concerning a twofold soul, from which if the divines of the age had been free, they would have formed more wise and more correct judgments on many points. The doctrine of Apollinaris met the approbation of many in nearly all the eastern provinces, and being explained in different ways, it became a source of new sects. But as it was assailed by the laws of the emperors, the decrees of councils, and the writings of learned men, it gradually sunk under these united assaults. At the head of those whom the contests with Arius led into still greater errors, may undoubtedly be placed Photinus, bishop of Sirmium, who in the year 343 advanced opinions concerning God equally remote from those of the Orthodox and those of the Arians. The temerity of the man was chastened not only by the Orthodox in their councils of Antioch in 345, of Milan in 347, and of Sirmium, but also by the Arians in a council held at Sirmium in 351. He was deprived of his office and died in exile in the year 372. After him, Macedonius, bishop of Constantinople, a distinguished semi-Arian teacher, being deprived of his office by the Council of Constantinople in the year 360, in his exile founded the sect of the Pneumatomachi. He openly professed that the Holy Spirit is a divine energy diffused throughout the universe, and not a person distinct from the Father and the Son. This doctrine was embraced by many in the Asiatic provinces, but the Council of Constantinople, assembled by Theodosius the Great in the year 381, and which is commonly considered as the second ecumenical council, early dissipated by its authority this young and immature sect. One hundred and fifty bishops present in this council defined fully and perfectly the doctrine of three persons and one God, as it is still professed by the great body of Christians, which the Nicene Council had only in part performed. They also anathematized all the heresies then known. In the 5th century the Arians, oppressed and persecuted by the imperial edicts, took refuge among those barbarous nations who gradually overturned the Roman Empire in the West, and found among the Goths, Heruli, Suevi, Vandals and Burgundians a fixed residence and a quiet retreat. Being now safe, they treated the Orthodox with the same violence which the Orthodox had employed against them and other heretics, and had no hesitation about persecuting the adherents to the Nicene doctrines in a variety of ways. The Vandals, who had established their kingdom in Africa, surpassed all the rest in cruelty and injustice. At first, Genseric, their king, and then Huneric, his son, demolished the temples of such Christians as maintained the divinity of the Savior, sent their bishops into exile, mutilated many of the more firm and decided, and tortured them in various ways, and they expressly stated that they were authorized to do so by the example of the emperors, who had enacted similar laws against the Donatists in Africa, the Arians and others who dissented from them in religion. At the beginning of the 6th century, the Arians were triumphant in some parts of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Not a few of the Asiatic bishops favored them. The Vandals in Africa, the Goths in Italy, many of the Gauls, the Suevi, the Burgundians, and the Spaniards openly espoused their interests. The Greeks, indeed, who approved of the Nicene Council, oppressed and also punished them wherever they were able but the Arians returned the like treatment, especially in Africa and Italy. Yet this prosperity of the Arians wholly terminated when, 
Under the auspices of Justinian, the Vandals were driven from Africa, and the Goths from Italy. For the other Aryan kings, Sigismund, king of the Burgundians, Theodimir, king of the Suivi and Lusitania, and Rekirid, king of Spain, without violence and war, suffered themselves to be led to a renunciation of the Aryan doctrine, and to efforts for its extirpation among their subjects by means of legal enactments and councils. Whether reason and arguments or hope and fear had the greater influence in this conversion of those kings, it is difficult to say, but it is certain that the Aryan sect was from this time dispersed and could never after recover any strength. The delegates to the council assembled in the first instance in one of the chief buildings of Nicaea, apparently for the purpose of a thanksgiving and a religious reunion. Whether it was an actual church may be questioned. Christians, no doubt, there had been in Bithynia for some generations. Already in the second century Pliny had found them, in such numbers, that the temples were deserted and the sacrifices neglected. But it would seem that on this occasion a secular building was fitted up as a temporary house of prayer. At least, the traditional account of the place, where their concluding prayers were held, exactly agrees with Strabo's account of the ancient gymnasium of Nicaea. It was a large building, shaped like a basilica, with an abscess at one end, planted in the center of the town, and thus commanding down each of the four streets a view of the four gates, and therefore called Mesomphalos, the navel of the city. Whether, however, this edifice actually was a church or not, its use as such on this occasion served as a precedent for most of the later councils. From the time of the Council of Chalcedon, they have usually been held within the walls of churches, but for this the first council, the church, so far as it was a church, was only used as the beginning and the end. After these thanksgivings were over, the members of the assembly must have been collected according to the divisions which shall now be described. The group, which above the rest attracts our attention, is the deputation from the Church of Egypt. Shrill above all other voices, vehement above all other disputants, brandishing their arguments, as it was described by one who knew them well, like spears, against those who sate under the same roof and ate of the same table as themselves, were the combatants from Alexandria, who had brought to its present pass the question which the council was called to decide. Foremost in the group on dignity, though not in importance or in energy, was the aged Alexander, whose imprudent sermon had provoked the quarrel and whose subsequent vacillation had encouraged it. He was the bishop, not indeed of the first, but of the most learned see of Christendom. He was known by a title which he alone officially bore in that assembly. He was the Pope. The Pope of Rome was a phrase which had not yet emerged in history. But Pope of Alexandria was a well-known dignity. Papa, that strange and universal mixture of familiar endearment and of reverential awe, extended in a general sense to all Greek presbyters and all Latin bishops, was the special address which, long before the name of patriarch or of archbishop, was given to the head of the Alexandrian church. In the patriarchal treasury at Moscow is a very ancient scarf or omophorion, said to have been given by the bishop of Nicaea in the 17th century to the Tsar Alexis, and to have been left to the Church of Nicaea by Alexander of Alexandria. It is white and is rudely worked with a representation of the ascension, possibly an allusion to the first Sunday of their meeting. This relic, true or false, is the nearest approach we can now make to the bodily presence of the old theologian. The shadow of death is already upon him. In a few months he will be beyond the reach of controversy. But close beside the Pope Alexander is a small, insignificant young man of hardly twenty-five years of age, of lively manners and speech, 
and of bright, serene countenance. Though he is but the deacon, the chief deacon or archdeacon of Alexander, he has closely riveted the attention of the assembly by the vehemence of his arguments. He is already taking the words out of the bishop's mouth, and briefly acting in reality the part he had before, as a child acted in name, and that in a few months he will be called to act, both in name and in reality. In some of the conventional pictures at the council, his humble rank as a deacon does not allow of his appearance, but his activity and prominence behind the scenes made enemies for him there, who will never leave him through life. Anyone who had read his passionate invectives afterward may form some notion of what he was when in the thick of his useful battles. That small, insignificant deacon is the great Athanasius. Next, after the Pope and deacon of Alexandria, we must turn to one of its most important presbyters, the parish priest of its principal church, which bore the name of Bocolis, and marked the first beginnings of what we should call a parochial system. In appearance he is the very opposite of Athanasius. He is sixty years of age, very tall and thin, and apparently unable to support his stature. He has an odd way of contorting and twisting himself, which his enemies compare to the wrigglings of a snake. He would be handsome, but for the emaciation and deadly pallor of his face, and a downcast look, imparted by a weakness of eyesight. At times his veins throb and swell and his limbs tremble, as if suffering from some violent internal complaint. The same, perhaps, that will terminate one day in his sudden and frightful death. There is a wild look about him, which at first sight is startling. His dress and demeanor are those of a rigid ascetic. He wears a long coat with short sleeves and a scarf of only half size, such as was the mark of an austere life, and his hair hangs in a tangled mass over his head. He is usually silent, but at times breaks out into fierce excitement, such as will give the impression of madness. Yet with all this, there are a sweetness in his voice and a winning, earnest manner which fascinates those who come across him. Among the religious ladies of Alexandria, he is said to have had, from the first, a following of not less than seven hundred. This strange, captivating, moonstruck giant is the heretic Arius, or, as his adversaries called him, the madman of Arras, or Mars. Close beside him was a group of his countrymen, of whom we know little, except their fidelity to him, through good report and evil. Saras, like himself a presbyter, from the Libyan province, Oizoius, a deacon of Egypt, Achilles, a reader, Theonus, bishop of Marmarica in the Cyrenaica, and Secundus, bishop of Ptolemais in the Delta. These were the most remarkable deputies from the Church of Alexandria. But from the interior of Egypt came characters of quite another stamp, not Greeks, nor Greece-sized Egyptians, but genuine Copts, speaking the Greek language not at all, or with great difficulty, living half or the whole of their lives in the desert, their very names taken from the heathen gods of the times of the ancient pharaohs. One was Potamon, bishop of Heracleopolis, far up the Nile, the other Paphnutius, bishop of the upper Thebaid, both are famous for the austerity of their lives. Potamon, that is, dedicated to Ammon, had himself visited the hermit Antony. Paphnutius, that is, dedicated to his god, had been brought up in a hermitage. Both, too, had suffered in the persecutions. Each presented the frightful spectacle of the right eye dug out with iron. Paphnutius, besides, came limping on one leg, his left having been hamstrung. Next in importance must be reckoned the bishop of Syria and of the interior of Asia, or, as they are sometimes called in the later councils, the eastern bishops, as distinguished from the Church of Egypt. Then, as afterward, there was a rivalry between those branches of Oriental Christendom, 
each from long neighborhood, knowing each, yet each tending in an opposite direction till, after the Council of Chalcedon, a community of heresy drew them together again. Here, as in Egypt, we find two classes of representatives, scholars from the more civilized cities of Syria, wild ascetics from the remoter east. The first in dignity was the orthodox Oestasius, who either was, or was on the point of being made, bishop of the capital of Syria, the metropolis of the eastern church, Antioch, then called the City of God. He had suffered in heathen persecutions, and was destined to suffer in Christian persecutions also. But he was chiefly known for his learning and eloquence, which was distinguished by an antique simplicity of life. One work alone has come down to us, on the Witch of Endor. Next in rank, and far more illustrious, was his chief suffragan, the Metropolitan of Palestine, the Bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius. We honor him as the father of ecclesiastical history, as the chief depository of the traditions which connect the fourth with the first century. But in the bishops of Nicaea his presence awakened feelings of a very different kind. He alone of the eastern prelates could tell what was in the mind of the emperor. He was the clerk of the imperial closet. He was the interpreter, the chaplain, the confessor of Constantine. And yet he was on the wrong side. Too especially we may be sure of the Egyptian church, were on the watch for any slip that he might make. Athanasius, whatever may have been the opinions of later times respecting the doctrines of Eusebius, was convinced that he was at heart an Arian. Potamon, of the one eye, had known him formerly in the days of persecution, and was ready with that most fatal taunt, which on a later occasion he threw out against him, that while he had thus suffered for the cause of Christ, Eusebius had escaped by sacrificing to an idol. If Eusebius was suspected of Arianism, he was supported by most of the suffragan bishops in Palestine, of whom Paulinus of Tyre and Patrophilus of Besthan, Scytopolis, were the most remarkable. One, however, a champion of orthodoxy, was distinguished not in himself, but for the see which he occupied, once the highest in Christendom, in a few years about to claim something of its former grandeur, but at the time of the council known only as a second-rate Syro-Roman city, Macarius, bishop of Aelia Capitolina, that is, Jerusalem. From Neo Caesarea, a border fortress on the Euphrates, came its confessor Bishop Paul, who, like Paphnutius and Potamon, had suffered in the persecutions, but more recently under Licinius. His hands were paralyzed by the scorching of the muscles of all the fingers with red-hot iron. Along with him were the orthodox representatives of four famous churches, who, according to the Armenian tradition, traveled in company. Their leader was the marvel, the Moses, as he was termed, of Mesopotamia, James, or Jacob, Bishop of Nisibis. He had lived for years as a hermit on the mountains, in the forests during the summer, in caverns during the winter, browsing on roots and leaves like a wild beast, and like a wild beast clothed in a rough goat-hair cloak. This dress and manner of life, even after he became bishop, he never laid aside, and the mysterious awe which his presence inspired was increased by the stories of miraculous powers which, we are told, he exercised in a manner as humane and playful as it was grotesque, as when he turned the washerwoman's hair white, detected the impostor who pretended to be dead, and raised an army of gnats against the Persians. His fame as a theologian rests on disputed writings. The second was Ait Alaha, the brought of God, like the Greek Theophorus, who had just occupied the see of Edessa, and finished the building of the cemetery of his cathedral. The third was Aristaces, said to be the cousin of Jacob of Bisibis and son of Gregory the Illuminator, founder of the Armenian Church, 
he represented both his father and the bishop Antiridates, the king of Armenia, the bishop and king having received a special invitation from Constantine, and sent their written professions of faith by the hands of Aristaces. The fourth came from beyond the frontier, the sole representative of the more distant east, John the Persian, who added to his name the more sounding title, here appearing for the first time, but revived in our own days as the designation of our own bishops of Calcutta, Metropolitan of India. A curious tradition related that this band, including eleven other names from the remote east, were the only numbers of the Nicene Council who had not sustained some bodily mutilation or injury. As this little band advanced westward, they encountered a remarkable personage, who stands at the head of the next group which we meet, the prelates of Asia Minor and Greece. This was Leontius of Caesarea and Cappadocia. From his hands, it was said, Gregory of Armenia had received ordination, and from his successors in the See of Caesarea had desired that every succeeding bishop of Armenia should receive ordination likewise. For this reason, it may be, Aristaces and his company sought them out. They found Leontius already on his journey, and they overtook him at a critical moment. He was on the point of baptizing another Gregory, father of a much more celebrated Gregory, the future bishop of Nasianzen. A light, it was believed, shone from the water, which was only discerned by the sacred travelers. Leontius was claimed by the Arians, but still more decidedly by the Orthodox. Others of the same side are usually named as from the same region, among them Hypatius of Gangra, whose end we shall witness at the close of these events, and Hermogenes the deacon, afterwards bishop of Caesarea, who acted as secretary to the council. Eusebius of Nicomedia, afterward of Constantinople, Theognis of Nicaea, Marys of Chalcedon, and Menomphatus of Ephesus were among the most resolute defenders of Arius. It is curious to reflect that they represent the four sees of the four orthodox councils of the church. The three last named soon vanish away from history, but Eusebius of Nicomedia, friend, namesake, perhaps even brother of the bishop of Caesarea, was a personage of high importance, both then and afterwards. As Athanasius was called the Great by the Orthodox, so was Eusebius by the Arians. Even miracles were ascribed to him. Originally Bishop of Beiruth, Berutus, he had been translated to the See of Nicomedia, then the capital of the Eastern Empire. He had been a favorite of the emperor's rival Licinius, and had thus become intimate with Constantia, the emperor's sister, the wife, now the widow of Licinius. Through her, and through his own distant relationship with the imperial family, he kept a hold on the court, which he never lost, even to the moment when he stood by the dying bed of the emperor, years afterward, and received him into the church. We must not be too hard on the Christianity of Eusebius, if we wish to indicate the baptism of Constantine. Not far from the great prelate of the capital of the East would be the representative of what was now a small Greek town, but in five years from that time would supersede altogether the glories of Nicomedia. Metrophanes, bishop of Byzantium, was detained by old age and sickness, but Alexander, his presbyter, himself seventy years of age, was there with a little secretary of the name of Paul, not more than twelve years old, one of the readers and collectors of the Byzantine church. Alexander had already corresponded with his namesake on the Arian controversy, and was apparently attached firmly to the orthodox side. Besides their more regular champions, the orthodox party of Greece and Asia Minor, had a few very eccentric allies. One was Accessius the Novatian, the Puritan, summoned by Constantine from Byzantium with Alexander, from the deep respect entertained by the emperor 
for his ascetic character. He was attended by a boy, Auxanon, who lived to a great age afterward as a presbyter in the same sect. This child was then living with a hermit, Aetikianus, on the heights of the neighboring mountain of the Bithynian Olympus, and he descended from these solitudes to attend upon Assisius. From him we have obtained some of the most curious details of the council. Marcellus, bishop of Ancyra, was among the bishops, the fiercest opponent of Arius, and when the active deacon of Alexandria was not present, seems to have borne the brunt of the arguments. Yet if we may judge from his subsequent history, Athanasius could never have been quite at ease in leaving the cause in his hands. He was one of those awkward theologians who never could attack Arianism without falling into Sabellianism, and in later life he was twice deposed from his see for heresy, once excommunicated by Athanasius himself, and in the present form of the Nicene Creed, one clause, that which asserts that the kingdom of Christ shall have no end, is said to have been expressly aimed at his exaggerated language. And now come two, who in the common pictures of the council always appear together, of whom the one probably left the deepest impression on his contemporaries, and the other, if he were present at all, on the subsequent traditions of the council. From the island of Cyprus there arrived the simple shepherd Spiridion, a shepherd both before and after his elevation to the episcopate. Strange stories were told by his fellow islanders to the historian Socrates of the thieves who were miraculously caught in attempting to steal his sheep, and of Spiridion's good-humoured reply when he found them in the morning and gave them a ram that they might not have sat up all night for nothing. Another tale, exactly similar to the fantastic Mussulman legends which hand about stories of Jerusalem, told how he had gained an answer from his dead daughter Irene to tell where a certain deposit was hidden. Two less marvelous but more instructive stories bring out the simplicity of his character. He rebuked a celebrated preacher at Cyprus for altering, in a quotation from the Gospels, the homely word for bed into couch. What? Are you better than he who said bed, that you are ashamed to use his words? On occasion of a wayworn traveller coming to him in Lent, finding no other food in the house, he presented him with salted pork, and when the stranger declined, saying that he could not, as a Christian, break his fast. So much the less reason, he said. Have you for scruple? To the pure, all things are pure. A characteristic legend attaches to the account of his journey to the council. It was his usual practice to travel on foot, but on this occasion the length of the journey, as well as the dignity of his office, induced him to ride, in company with his deacon, on two mules, a white and a chestnut. One night at his arrival at a caravan Sari, where a cavalcade of orthodox bishops were already assembled, the mules were turned out to pasture, while he retired to his devotions. The bishops had conceived an alarm, lest the cause of orthodoxy should suffer in the council by the ignorance or awkwardness of the shepherd of Cyprus, when opposed to the subtleties of the Alexandrian heretic. Accordingly, taking advantage of his encounter, they determined to throw a decisive impediment in his way. They cut off the heads of his two mules, and then, as is the custom in oriental travelling, started on their journey before sunrise. Spiridion also rose, but was met by his terrified deacon, announcing the unexpected disaster. On arriving at the spot, the saint bade the deacon to attach the heads to the dead bodies. He did so, and at a sign from the bishop, the two mules with their restored heads shook themselves, as if from a deep sleep, and started to their feet. Spiridion and the deacon mounted, 
and soon overtook the travellers. As the day broke, the prelates and the deacon were like astonished at seeing that he, performing the annexation in the dark and in haste, had fixed the heads on the wrong shoulders, so that the white mule had now a chestnut head, and the chestnut mule had the head of its white companion. Thus the miracle was doubly attested, the bishops doubly discomfited, and the simplicity of Spiridion doubly exemplified. Many more stories might be told of him, but to use the words of an ancient writer who has related some of them, from the claws you can make out the lion. Of all the Nicene fathers, it may yet be said, that in a certain curious sense he is the only one who has survived the decay of time. After resting for many years in his native Cyprus, his body was transferred to Constantinople, where it remained till a short time before the fall of the empire. It was thence conveyed to Corfu, where it is still preserved. Hence, by a strange resuscitation of fame, he has become the patron saint, one might almost say, the divinity of the Ionian Islands. Twice a year, in solemn procession, he is carried around the streets of Corfu. Hundreds of Corfuids bear his name, now abridged into the familiar diminutive of Spiro. The superstitious veneration entertained for the old saint is a constant source of quarrel between the English residents and the native Ionians. But the historian may be pardoned for gazing with a momentary interest on the dead hands, now black and withered, that subscribed the creed of Nicaea. Still more famous, and still more apocryphal, at least in his attendance at Nicaea, is Nicholas, Bishop of Myra. Not mentioned by a single ancient historian, he yet figures in the traditional pictures of the council as the foremost figure of all. Type as he is of universal benevolence to sailors, to thieves, to the victims of thieves, to children, known by his broad red face and flowing white hair, the traditions of the East always represent him as standing in the midst of the assembly, and suddenly roused by righteous indignation to assail the heretic Arius with a tremendous box on the ear. One more group of deputies closes the arrivals. The Nicene Council was a council of the Eastern Church, and Eastern seemingly were at least 310 of the 318 bishops. But the West was not entirely unrepresented. Nicasius from France, Marcus from Calabria, Capito from Sicily, Aistorgius from Milan, where a venerable church is still dedicated to his memory, Domnus of Stridon in Pannonia, were the less conspicuous deputies of the western provinces. But there were five men whose presence must have been full of interest to their eastern brethren. Corresponding to John the Persian from the extreme east was the Theophilus the Goth from the extreme north. His light complexion doubtless made a marked contrast with the tawny hue and dark hair of almost all the rest. They rejoiced to think that he, they had a genuine Scythian among them. From all future generations of his Teutonic countrymen, he may claim attention as the predecessor and teacher of Ulfilas, the great missionary of the Gothic nation. Out of the province of northern Africa, the earliest cradle of the Latin church, came Cassilan, bishop of Carthage. A few years ago he had himself been convened before the two western councils of the Lateran and of Arles, and had there been acquitted of the charges brought against him by the Donatists. If any of the distant Orientals had hoped to catch a sight of the bishop of the imperial city, they were doomed to disappointment. Doubtless had he been there, his position as prelate of the capital would have been if not first, at least among the first. But Sylvester was now far advanced in years, and in his place came the two presbyters, who, according to the arrangement laid down by the emperor, would have accompanied him had he been able to make the journey. 
in this simple deputation later writers have seen, and perhaps by a gradual process the connection might be traced, the first germ of Legati alla Terra. But it must have been a very far-seeing eye, which, in Victor and Vincentius, the two unknown elders, representing their sick old bishop, could have detected the predecessors of Pandolf or of Wolsey. With them, however, was a man who, though now long forgotten, was then an object of deeper interest to Christendom than any bishop of Rome could at that time have been. It was the world-renowned Spaniard, as he is called by Eusebius, the magician from Spain, as he is called by Zosimus, Hosius, bishop of Cordova. He was the representative of the westernmost of European churches, but, as Eusebius of Caesarea was the chief counsellor of the emperor in the Greek church, so was Hosius in the Latin, as shown in the darkest and most mysterious crisis of Constantine's life. It was probably by degrees that these different arrivals took place, and the lapse of two or three weeks must be supposed for the preparatory arrangements before the council was formally opened. This interval was occupied by eager discussions on the questions likely to be debated. The first assemblage had been, as we have seen, within the walls of a public building, but the other preliminary meetings were held, as was natural, in the streets or colonnades in the open air. The novelty of the occasion had collected many strangers to the spot. Laymen, philosophers, heathen, as well as Christians, might be seen joining in the arguments on either side, orthodox as well as heretical. There were also discussions among the orthodox themselves as to the principle on which the debate should be conducted. The enumeration of the characters just given shows that there were two very different elements in the assembly, such indeed as will always constitute the main difficulty in making any general statements of theology, which shall be satisfactory at once to the few and to the many. A large number, perhaps the majority, consisted of rough, simple, almost illiterate men, like Spiridion the shepherd, Potamon the hermit, Assisius the Puritan, who held their faith earnestly and sincerely, but without conscious knowledge of the grounds on which they maintained it, incapable of arguing themselves, or of entering into the argument of their opponents. These men, when suddenly brought into collision with the acutest and most learned disputant of the age, naturally took up the position that the safest course was to hold by what they had been handed down, without any further inquiry or explanation. A story, somewhat variously told, is related of an encounter of one of these simple characters with the more philosophical combatants, which, in whatever way it be taken, well illustrates the mixed character of the council and the choice of the courses open before it. As Socrates describes the incident, the disputes were running so high, from the mere pleasure of argument, that there seemed likely to be no end to the controversy, when suddenly a simple-minded layman, who by his sightless eye or limping leg bore witness of his zeal for the Christian faith, stepped among them and abruptly said, Christ and the Apostles left us not a system of logic, nor a vain deceit, but a naked truth to be guided by faith and good works. There has, says Bishop K. in recording the story, been hardly any age of the Church in which its members have not required to be reminded of this lesson. On the present occasion, the bystanders, at least for the moment, were struck by its happy application. The disputants, after hearing his plain word of truth, took their differences more good-humouredly, and the hubbub of controversy subsided. The tradition grew in later times into the form which it bears in all the pictures of the council, and which is commemorated in the services of the Greek church. Aware of his incapacity of argument, he took a brick and said, You deny that three can be one. Look at this. It is one, 
and yet it is composed of the three elements of fire, earth, and water. As he spoke, the brick resolved itself into its component parts. The fire flew upward, the clay remained in his hand, and the water fell to the ground. The philosopher, or, according to some accounts, Arius himself, was so confounded as to declare himself converted on the spot. These tales represent probably the feeling of a large portion of the council, the sound, unprofessional, untheological, lay element, which lay at the basis of all their weakness and their strength. The historian Socrates is very anxious to prove that the assembly was not entirely composed of men of this kind, and he points triumphantly to the presence of such men as Eusebius of Caesarea. No proof was necessary. The subsequent history of the council itself is a sufficient indication that however small a minority might be the dialections and the theologians, yet they constitute the life and movement of the whole. Socrates dwells with evident pleasure on the circumstance that the ultimate decisions were only made after long inquiry, and that everything was stirred to the bottom. We may wish, with Bishop Jeremy Taylor and Bishop Kay, that it had been otherwise. But there is a point of view in which we may fully sympathize with the course that was taken. All the elements which go to make up the interest of theology were involved. Love of free inquiry, desire of precision in philosophical statements, research into Christian antiquity, comparison of the texts of scripture one with another. Traditional and episcopal authority was regarded as insufficient for the establishment of the faith. The well-known clause of the 21st article does but express the principle of the Nicene Fathers themselves. Things ordained by them as necessary for salvation have neither strength nor authority unless it may be declared that they are taken out of Holy Scripture. The battle was fought and won by quotations, not from tradition, but from the Old and New Testaments. The overruling sentiment was that even ancient opinions were not to be received without sifting and inquiry. The chief combatant and champion of the faith was not the Bishop of Antioch or of Rome, nor the Pope of Alexandria, but the deacon Athanasius. The eager discussions of Nicaea present the first grand precedent for the duty of private judgment and the free, unrestrained exercise of biblical and historical criticism.